next on Life Focus. About two o'clock, as best I can recall, in the morning on January 20th, um, I was awakened out of a deep sleep by just this horrible dream that I had. I found myself standing in a group of uh, what appeared to be a schoolroom, uh, a group of students, and in the dream I suddenly uh, heard explosions, uh, some were gunshots, sounded like firecrackers going off. And then I saw in the dream bloody spots starting to appear on some of the bodies of the students, and just panic broke out. He was just saying um, they were killing kids. He was sweating, and he said that um, he saw the kids coming out, even with their, with their hands on their heads. He didn't know what it meant. It was three months exactly to the day before Columbine happened, and that was a tremendous confirmation to me from God that uh, somehow I had a role to play in this. On April 20th, 1999, two angry teenage boys bent on killing as many of their classmates as possible approached Columbine High School in Littleton, Colorado, and opened fire. Eating lunch outside Columbine, 17-year-old Rachel Scott was one of the first killed. After her death, her many journals were discovered, and a remarkable story began to unfold. Her diaries revealed a deeply spiritual girl with an extraordinary intuition. An intuition about her life. This will be my last year, Lord. About her death. It isn't suicide. And about her killers. I consider it homicide. This is her story. Hello everyone, I'm Dan Meyer, and welcome to Life Focus. America will never forget the tragedy that occurred 10 years ago in which two teenagers killed 13 people and themselves at suburban Denver's Columbine High School. 17-year-old Rachel Scott was the very first victim of that massacre. And soon after, her grieving family uncovered some of her writings, predicting her fate. Rachel's story is one of visions, dreams, and writings so prophetic, you'll have to see them to believe them. And today, you'll have a chance to do just that. Rachel was joyful. Her middle name was Joy. Um, Rachel, she lit up a room when she walked in. Uh, but she also had a lot of depth to her, and somehow that, sh that showed, it, you know, her depth and her lightheartedness were both there. Go after God. Whatever it takes, do it. And don't give the excuse, I'm just a teenager, or I'll do that when I grow up, because it doesn't work that way. God wants to know you now. I wanted to be friends with her because um, right away, she told me that she had a really good relationship with God. I want to be used by you to help others. Over and over she would plead with God to use her. She'd just, please God, please use me. Please use me to show people the way. Come to me, God, and make use of me. Some people only reach out to people if they're easy to reach out to or easy to talk to. What about the, the kid that has no social skills? or the person who nobody else talks to, who's shy and withdrawn. Rachel would reach out to those people. Actually, she targeted those people. I have this theory that if one person can go out of their way to show compassion, then it will start a chain reaction of the same. A month before Rachel died, she wrote a two-page essay called My Ethics and My Codes of Life. And in that essay, she challenged her reader twice to start a chain reaction of kindness and compassion. People will never know how far a little kindness can go. Rachel's theory was that the smallest little act of kindness or compassion can ripple out. My codes may seem like a fantasy that can never be reached, but test them for yourself and see the kind of effect they have in the lives of people around you. You may just start a chain reaction. At the same time that she wrote that essay, Eric Harris and Dylan Klebold were making a videotape, March of 99, and they said, or Eric Harris looks at the camera, her killer, and he says, we need to get a chain reaction going here. Rachel shared a class with her killers. For one project, the boys turned in a video depicting brutality and murder. 
Rachel's project for the assignment also mentioned death, but in a very different light. What if you were to die today? What would happen to you? Where would you go? The teacher said you can uh, draw anything you want, make a poster. She chose to take her hand, she put it on a photocopy machine and uh, blew it up into a poster with rainbow colors and she wrote around the edges, he gave his life for me, I will give my life to him, Jesus Christ. And in the center of her hand, she wrote a challenge. Tomorrow is not a promise, but a chance. It may not be there for you. After death, then what? Eternity is in your hands. Change it. She was a doodler and did abstract art and things, and there were two themes that she repeated. One was the hands, and one was the rose. I had a journal that I used to draw in, and one time she was spending the night at my house, and I let her draw a picture in there. So she drew her hand and swirled around it and drew a rose next to it. Rachel's drawings of her hands and a rose would go on to paint a prophetic portrait of the future. Many of her writings also seemed equally inspired. On May 2, 1998, Rachel, at age 16, wrote a startling three-sentence entry in her diary. This will be my last year, Lord. I've gotten what I can. Thank you. Rachel was only a sophomore in high school. She couldn't have been talking about her graduation from school. She was so, so blunt. She'd say, I'm going to die young. She'd just say it just like that. I'm going to die young, or I'm not going to make it that far. We get upset with her. You know, a lot of people would just say, stop saying that, okay? That's just not, you know, it's a downer. And, she'd, and that was her thing. She'd, well, it's not a downer. It's not a... I don't, I don't have a problem with it. Just weeks before her death, Rachel wrote poems that predicted a fate no one could have imagined. I'm dying. Quickly my soul leaves. Slowly my body withers. It isn't suicide. I consider it homicide. The world you have created has led to my death. I need to understand something about Rachel. Rachel wasn't depressed. She wasn't morbid. She wasn't obsessed with death. And uh, our family had never heard her talk about it. She uh, seemed to have a special calling from God and that he was dealing with her in a very, very special way. And uh, in retrospect, I think really preparing her for what was about to happen. Rachel's very last poem spoke of tragedy. Am I the only one who sees? Am I the only one who craves your glory? Am I the only one who longs to be forever in your loving arms? All I want is for someone to walk with me through these halls of a tragedy. It just felt like it was another normal day of school. Me and Rachel rode in the car together to school. Every time Sarah saw her that morning, Rachel was concentrating on only one thing, drawing a picture in her journal. This picture would soon speak volumes. I saw her in the morning, and um, she's sitting there drawing in her journal. And then in math class, it was something confusing. It always was to me. So I was looking, and then I look over at her. She was sat, like, to my left. And she was drawing in her journal, and I was thinking, Rachel, why aren't you paying attention? This is confusing. And she just wasn't even paying attention at all. She was just drawing in her journal. And then we had acting a couple periods later, and again, she was drawing in her journal. <laughs> When class was over, before she went to lunch, Rachel showed her acting teacher, Sue Carruthers, the drawing. I asked her about it, and she said to me, well, Mrs. Carruthers, it's not finished, but I was inspired to draw this. And I said, Rachel, it's absolutely amazing. Would you explain it? And she said, well, it's just my tears. I'm crying. Then she looked at me and said, Mrs. Carruthers, I'm going to be an impact on the world. And I looked back at her and said, Rachel, I have no doubt of that. Rachel and friend Richard Castaldo then went outside to eat lunch. Craig Scott had a free hour and went to Columbine's library to study. When I walked into the library, I saw a friend of mine, Matt Hector and went and sat by him and we were studying for the same test. We had a lot of the same classes together. And 
I walked around the room a little bit and I talked to another one of my friends, Isaiah Scholes. And a few minutes later, I started hearing what sounded like popping noises. And all of a sudden, a kid walked in who had been shot and he had blood all over himself and he fell down at the door. And the, the teacher yelled at us to get all the students to get under the desks. Okay, has anybody been injured, ma'am? Yes. Okay. Yes. And the school is in a panic, and I'm in the library. I've got students down under the table, kids. Heads under the table. Me and my buddy Matt got underneath the desk, and my friend Isaiah then walked by, and he was looking for a place to sit, so he sat next to me. Okay. Oh, God. Stay in the line of things. Oh, God. Just stay down. Do we know where he's at? Oh, he's up here. He's right outside of here. He's outside. Eric and Dylan came into the library, and they were yelling to each other and shooting off their guns, and that's when we, me, Matt, and Isaiah looked at each other, and we, could, we knew that this was really serious, and we were really scared. Eric and Dylan just taunted and mocked some of the students and they were laughing in an evil way and they were just full of evil and hatred. It is the darkness within that destroys what once was sacred. The destruction feeds on my soul, the hatred burned in my heart, the lies upon my tongue, the hurt flowing through my fingers. They came up and they saw Isaiah. And Isaiah was one of the very few black students in the school. And they began to make fun of Isaiah for being black. And the last thing that Isaiah heard in his life were racial slurs being made against him. And the last thing that he said was, I want to see my mom. And they shot Isaiah with a shotgun in the head. And then they shot my friend Matt. The only witness to Rachel's death was Richard Costaldo, who was eating with her outside when the shooting began. Two bullets tore through Richard's spine, paralyzing him. Rachel was hit three times and tried to crawl to safety. Richard heard her crying. And when he was in the hospital afterwards, he recounted her last moments. And my understanding is that uh, Eric Harris had shot Rachel three times and about five or six minutes passed before the final shot. And he walked over to her and lifted up her head by her hair and he said, do you still believe in God? And uh, Rachel looked him in the eye and said, you know I do. As I was weeping and crying and fell to my knee, I heard the Lord's voice. He was speaking to me. He said there would be no more sin, no more lies, only peace and happiness in all of my cries. And he said, then go be with him. And he shot her execution style. And I believe that's exactly what happened. I think that she did go be with him. They took my sister, who had a lot of potential. And she, she had a lot of dreams and a lot of passion. And she made a difference in a lot of people's lives. And they killed her. Millions of people watched the live broadcast of Rachel's funeral. Bruce Porter, whose dream was strangely reminiscent of the tragedy, officiated. I really believe that Rachel left behind a legacy of what true Christianity is all about. She didn't compromise what she believed. She didn't compromise the message of Christ. But she lived it in a way that made it very, very difficult for people who didn't believe to argue with her. Porter's dream came three months before the tragedy. After Columbine, the dream of an Ohio businessman would also take on great significance. His name was Frank Amedia, and he had followed the Columbine story along with the rest of the world. And one night as I was praying, I, I, it was as if a vision came across, and I saw a girl's eyes and tears coming from those eyes. 
After days of having this same dream, Frank contacted Rachel's father. He said, I'm a practical businessman. I'm not a mystical or spooky person. And he said, I honestly don't put a lot of stock in people's dreams or visions. But he said, for the last two weeks, I've had a dream uh, consistently over and over about your daughter. I had this vision of the eyes of a girl. And out of those eyes were coming tears. And the tears were pouring to the ground. And something was beginning to grow out of the ground. Life was coming out of the ground. And seven days later, the, the sheriff's department called and said, we have your daughter's backpack. You can come pick it up. So I rushed over and got her backpack, took it out to my vehicle, opened up, uh, pulled out her last diary, and uh, turned to the final page. And I was absolutely stunned when I opened up Rachel's uh, final page in her diary. And there was a picture of her eyes and a trickle of tears falling from her eyes, and they were watering the rose. But there's 13 clear tears that fall from her eyes before they touch the rose and turn to blood drops. And within two hours of her drawing that picture, 13 people had died at Columbine, a teacher and 12 students. In a completed sketch, Rachel had drawn this same rose growing out of Colorado's state flower, the Columbine. When I began to see that, I understood this was m more than about me losing a daughter. This had to do with God's overall purposes in this world today. But Craig still had problems coping with the aftermath of Columbine. It was a really hard road afterwards. I went through a lot of depression. I had bad nightmares. I had paranoia. I had anger to deal with towards the shooters. I had to make a choice. Was I going to let Columbine rob me? Or was I going to become a better person because of it? Combine was a huge obstacle to overcome the aftermath. I'm still overcoming it. I still get sad, and I still have some healing to do. But I feel like, for the most part, I've recovered, and I'm back to being myself without the negative effects of Columbine and with the positive effects. In the year following Rachel's death, her family wrote the book Rachel's Tears and published a compilation of her writings in the journals of Rachel Scott. But that was not the end of Rachel's story. In many ways, it was only the beginning. I was meant to have faith in God because of her. In high school, it's hard to find people that are true friends. No one wants to say hi to you. No one cares about if you look upset. No one cares. She did. Valerie was an outsider who wanted to fit in, but never quite did. She caused problems at school and got into trouble for drug use. And most people that found out about my past with experimenting with drugs and stuff like that judged me because of that. Rachel, instead of judging me for it, kind of more felt for me and tried to understand how to help people like that. Rachel's unconditional friendship transformed Valerie's outlook on life. She helped me feel better about myself. She helped me realize that there are good people out there. She made me want to be a better person. And on faith. I didn't really believe in God until I had a chance to actually be friends with and walk with someone that would change so many lives. Rachel's influence did not end with those who knew her at Columbine. Through her death, thousands of high school students hear her story every year through Rachel's Challenge, a school assembly program the Scott family developed based on Rachel's paper, My Ethics, My Codes of Life. Rachel's story is so powerful, not because I think she was superhuman, not because I think she was super spiritual, but because I think she showed that, you know, it's the little things that matter. And looking out for people and taking care of other people is probably the most important thing that you can do while you're here. Two and a half years after Rachel's story and journals were already in print, the Scott family found one more message of Rachel's, drawn on the back of an old dresser she'd had when she was only 13. The theme was, once again, about her hands. She had outlined her hands kind of like this. And in the center of those hands, she had written that these, these hands, hands belonged belong to, to Rachel, Rachel Joy Scott, and will someday touch millions of people's hearts. Her story had reached millions of people, 
at that point, and we just couldn't believe that out of everything she could have written inside of her hands, that that's what she wrote, and that, that it would be so, so true. <laughs> Please reach out your hand. Grab a hold of their life. Don't let go without a good fight. She was a person that changed me, and I want to be a person that can also change other people. So maybe like, if I can reach this one person, it'll be that same type of chain reaction. Out of, the, out of the worst pain of my life, I've received the greatest joy of seeing so many lives transformed and touched. I believe that God can take any tragedy and use it for a triumph. He can take even the most horrific things that we go through and turn them upside down. And beneath the horrors of life, we can find hope and peace. Witness to them. Show them the way. Give them God's love and give it today. More than 2,000 people attended Rachel Scott's funeral on April 24, 1999. It was televised nationwide and was the most watched event on CNN up to that point, surpassing even the funeral of Diana, Princess of Wales. Today, her father, Daryl Scott, carries on her legacy, seeking to inspire teenagers around the world to take on Rachel's challenge of practicing compassion and kindness. Well, that's all for today's Life Focus. For now, we're so glad you joined us. I'm Dan Meyer, and I'll see you again next time. Rachel left behind a legacy of what true Christianity is all about. More information about this program or other Life Focus episodes can be found online at www.lifefocus.tv. Pricing and ordering information for a DVD copy of this program are available on our website or by phone at 1-877-908-5433. The title of today's program is on the screen.